Kyle Platt here with Jake DeSillis. Jake is the author of Becoming an Entrepreneur, How to Find Freedom and Fulfillment as a Business Owner. Hi, Jake. Uh, thanks so much for being on. Hi, Kyle. Thanks so much for having me. So how is liberty and freedom, how is that life tied to being an entrepreneur? How are they inextricable? Well, I think there's a couple of ways. Um, I, always, I really like the way that Harry Brown used to talk about finding freedom uh, in an unfree world. So I think for, for the individual, for me, um, becoming an entrepreneur is the best way to experience maximum liberty in your own lifetime. You know, it's an opportunity to, to really follow your own passion, to do what you want, and to choose the life for yourself. But I think it's more than just that. It's, it's not only a great opportunity for an individual to find liberty. It's also the case that entrepreneurship is fundamentally about uh, increasing liberty for everyone. Because, you know, in, people have conflicts over scarce resources. And, you know, as people interested in liberty, we are very concerned with just rules for how we should get on together and how we should manage scarce resources. And, and that's great and really important. But the other aspect is, you know, the less scarcity we have, the less conflict there is in the world. So entrepreneurship is about improving the opportunity for freedom in a very real, tangible sense that for everyone. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, reading your book, I see that it seems that what's more important to someone entering the world of entrepreneurialism is gaining time, not so much gaining a whole lot of money, but time, and that time translates to freedom. Is that a good interpretation? Yeah, for me, certainly. I, I really see financial freedom in particular as being about the amount of time that you have before you have to do a job that you don't want to do. So, you know, there are even, even people who have a very uh, sort of rich lifestyle, if you like, high consumption lifestyle, can sometimes feel very unfree because they have a huge amount of financial responsibilities on an ongoing basis and consequently they feel stuck in the work that they're doing because they don't feel able to break out and maybe start a business of, the, uh, of their own or whatever. So uh, yeah, I, I certainly think that, that real freedom is about having the opportunity to pursue whatever is meaningful to you and the, the length of time that you have before you have to go and do something that's not meaningful to you, you know, a job that you don't want to do, that, that length of time is the, is the sort of real freedom that you're able to achieve. And so that's what I focus on. And certainly what I see as one of the main benefits of entrepreneurship is, is giving you that kind of freedom. That reminds me of a graph I saw where as income increased, there was a certain plateau point in which happiness did not increase. For the most part, uh, the happiness did increase, but, but at a certain point, at a certain income, it does, you, the, the individual does not get any happier. And, I th and, 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 and in certain cases, they become less happy. And it made me think perhaps, well, looking at your stuff, it made me think that perhaps the reason is because they get stuck in this cycle of making sure that they maintain the business. So you, you think that perhaps entrepreneurialism is a lifestyle and not so much just making a lot of money, and it's necessary to move on from ventures and start new ones constantly. Yeah, or at least to be doing stuff that still really gives you fulfillment. You know, um, one of the things that I only learned through the process of, of starting a business was how important it is to extract yourself from the day-to-day -day work, to, to really make yourself redundant so that you're able to think about where you want to take the venture as a business owner or other things that might fulfill you in life. And a lot of people create brilliant, successful businesses but get incredibly stuck in the grind of you know, just endless work. There's so much work when you start a business. And at some point, you have to find a way to extract yourself from that and make yourself redundant. And for me, that you know, ultimately, uh, what was meaningful to me was to start a business and then eventually sell it and, and think about other things that I wanted to do in life, like, for example, now writing. So, yeah, I, I, I do think that it's important to differentiate between making money and getting freedom. 
And for me, getting freedom is the key thing. And, and financial freedom is obviously a very, very fundamental freedom. But there comes a point when you've, you've got enough that you can do whatever you want. And that's more important than just continually uh, striving uh, and, and working you know, really long hours. So is the entrepreneurialism the means to the end of achieving the freedom of doing what you want to do? Or is entrepreneurialism a joy in and of itself? I think it has to be a joy in and of itself because otherwise, you know, I mean, there's so much stress involved that if you don't actually enjoy it, then, uh, then it's just going to be really punishing. And that's one of the great opportunities of, of entrepreneurship as well. Is it, it is a chance to work on something that you're really passionate about, that you really believe in, that you think is important. And it's a chance to make a tangible difference to the world. You know, as an entrepreneur, you're bringing something new. You're creating resources for people. You're creating opportunity. You're providing freedom for other people. And that's really fulfilling. You know, if, you, if you're able to, to do something that, that really uh, creates improvement in, in people's lives, there's a wonderful fulfillment in, in the doing of it. So I think it's got to be fulfilling in itself. That's sort of one of the reasons that I wrote the book was that I wanted to try and find a way to, to help identify how to make it fulfilling and how to make it a process that regardless of your financial end game, that you get huge fulfillment just from doing itself. Can you tell us some ways, without giving away too much because everyone needs to read the book, can you tell us some ways to keep entrepreneurialism fulfilling? Well, I think one of the key things is is finding a business that you can really believe in. And a part of that is actually identifying the purpose. I mean, this is something that it's often quite hard to do in the early stages is to, to really identify what the purpose of the business is. And to be able to explain that in such a simple way that anyone can understand it. Because, you know, especially if you want people to work together with you and if you want customers to buy what, what it is that you're producing, nobody is interested in you becoming an entrepreneur because you want to make money or, or whatever. People are interested in the purpose of the business, what its meaning is for them, and you know, what benefits it can bring them, and what good it does in the world. You know, what, what's the problem that this business is solving, and what's the benefit that it's bringing? And if you can stay connected to that purpose, that for me is what got me out of bed in the morning. That's what enables me to, to, you know, to do uh, projects that I love doing. And, and so, for example, you know, I'm, I'm writing about entrepreneurship because I think it's such an important part of improving not just individuals' lives, but overall human liberty. And I think entrepreneurship is, is really a key part of, of progress. So that's why I'm writing about it. And that's what keeps me doing what I do now. And in my previous business, I was very passionate about improving environments for pedestrians because it, it was what we did was a, a kind of modeling and simulation of pedestrian flows. So you know, I think that's the key is to find uh, the purpose of your business that's not about you. It's not about you as an entrepreneur, but it's about what you can provide for other people. Interesting. And uh, it seems to go in diametric opposite to the idea or conventional wisdom, the narrative that we've been told throughout the 20th and 21st century, that a business is bad and the business owner only wants to make money. You say it's very important that your business is doing something good for your community or for humankind as a whole. Is that true? Yeah, I think that's, you know, that's why people are going to want to buy your product because it gives tangible benefits. It increases you know, pe the people's quality of life. And this is one of the amazing things about entrepreneurship and voluntary negotiation is that you're actually improving people's lives without taking anything away. You're finding a way, an opportunity to increase the overall uh, amount of resources in the world and the overall benefits that people, people receive. Sure. So I see a lot of people who are stuck in the stagnation of wage labor or even, <clears throat> even as managers or bosses of their own companies, but they don't understand how to step into that mystical world of entrepreneurialism. They don't understand how to take the first step. They don't know how to accumulate the capital. They say, well, I don't come from means. I, I have no way to be an entrepreneur. What are some ways in which a person who thinks that the world of entrepreneurialism is completely alien to them can step into that world and begin to truly enjoy the fruits of, uh, the fruits of it? Mm, I think that's a great question. And 
just to, to, to start off by saying I really understand that stuckness and I think there are really good reasons for it because fundamentally um, schooling is about turning kids into employees. You know, we are trained and conditioned to be employees and, we are, and that happens for over a decade. So, you know, everybody has got quite a lot of conditioning to overcome in order to step into entrepreneurship. So it's very understandable why that this is a, a psychologically difficult thing to do. And that's actually something that I write about a lot in the book is overcoming your conditioning, your employee conditioning. So I do really understand that. But I mean, there's obviously, there's a, it's a very big topic, so there's a lot that we could talk about. But there's just three things, I think, if you're starting out and you're thinking about it, and you're thinking, what kind of a business could I start? Well, you know, what can I do? What would, what would be the opportunity that would be right for me? I think there's three things to consider. The first is to develop empathy for your potential customers. You really have to understand what it is that people want or, or that, you, that you could provide them. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to think about a business that you yourself would be a customer for, that you, you want this solution because you need it. And that's an easy way of developing empathy. But if your business idea isn't, it's not possible for you to be a customer, then you need to really go out there and try and understand the people that you want to appeal to and try and really get into their shoes so that you have empathy. That will take you through the process of change that your business will certainly go through. Because whatever your initial idea is, it's going to change. And having empathy for your customers, being able to understand what their needs are, is one, uh, one important aspect. Another thing to think about is uh, really understanding the industry that you're going to be working in. You might do that by starting out getting a job in, a, in the industry, or you may be able to do it through talking to people in your family or friends or extended network who work in that industry. But you really need to understand how money flows around people in that industry and how you can plug in to the industry. Um, so even if you've got a great idea, you need to understand sort of how to, how to plug in. And industry knowledge is, is, is key to that. And the third thing um, is, is really technical expertise. It's, it's being good at something rare and valuable. And that's something that I guess seems more like the kind of training that we, that we get or conditioning that we get in school. But the key is it's not just about knowing about something, it's about knowing how to deliver something that is valuable to other people. So getting really good at doing something that you can then uh, provide value to others with. That's all, uh, I mean, that's a very high level general um, commentary about it, but um, I think it's a key question and really that's what my book's all about. Sure, sure. Uh, what about some more practical ways? Uh, it, it's, the theoretical stuff is very important and I think that everyone needs to understand that they do have value. Um, you're right, school teaches us that we don't have value unless we fit into specific boxes. Uh, but everyone has value that they can bring to other people. What about accumulating capital, uh, finding investors, finding the certain field that, that a person wants to step into? Or maybe blazing new trails? Yeah. Well, this is a really key thing, and, and like most entrepreneurs, I also started out thinking, like, okay, how do I, how am I going to get investment? How am I going to get capital to start this business? And, I mean, people can get so stuck in that phase as well. They can go for years just trying to find capital to get started. And what I came to understand um, through the process of doing it, I did eventually take out a huge loan to, to start my business, which I, I managed to pay off. But what I came to understand is that, Actually, you learn so much more the less money you, you start with. If you start with, and it's often called a minimum viable product, you know, just basically the very bare minimum that you can get out there. If you start selling and you start actually appealing to customers and seeing if you can you know, meet their needs, you learn so much in the process. And that means that you don't waste money investing in products that nobody wants, but you're always working towards a more desirable, more useful product. And so ultimately, I would invite people to think about not taking funding. Think about what you can do to start in the very minimum way possible and basically financing your business from revenue. This is the, the sort of really the best way to have independence as an entrepreneur is to start simple and start small and be very customer focused so that you can build up a relationship through selling as, as soon as possible. And that's how you learn. I mean, this is, I, I wanted to avoid selling at first. A lot of uh, entrepreneurs do. You know, you want to 
work on your fantastic new gadget that you think is going to be great. You want to get funding so that you can do the R&D and develop the product. But actually, the selling is the process whereby you learn whether or not to change the product in, in, in this way or that way and how to make you know, your business more appealing. So that would be my sort of suggestion on, on that side. And, and you know, to, to really look at what would be the minimum I could start with and the minimum amount of funding that I could use. Okay. Well, that's all fantastic stuff, and everybody needs to check out the book. Uh, you should also go to thevoluntarylife.com, uh, which is Jake's blog, and uh, you know, check him out on uh, Liberty Me, and absolutely uh, get started tomorrow to become the entrepreneurs of the future. Thanks so much for being on, Jake. It's, it's really been a pleasure. Thanks, Carl. That was great fun. All right, all right. Hey, enjoy your day. Cheers. Cheers.